Hello everyone. Today we are doing another episode of EAM Experts with Frank Santiago. Um, he is the director of operations support systems in Invernery. Frank, thank you for joining us today. Um, so today what we're going to be talking about is the journey to maintenance excellence specifically for Invenergy. Um, but before we get started, could you tell us a little bit about your background and um, you know how you got there? Absolutely. So my career started in the Navy, uh, fresh out of high school, joined the Navy at 18, uh, joined the nuclear program uh, as an electrician. So I spent six years, you know, they say, join the Navy, see the world. I actually saw uh, Virginia for a majority of that. Um, <laughs> after that, after getting out of the Navy, so that was my introduction to maintenance and um, power generation. Uh, after getting out, I had a small stint with a uh, high volume manufacturing facility. They made automatic transmission filters. So I worked in um, automation and, um, you know, working the line again, tying in my maintenance background, uh, fixing the, the shop equipment. Uh, after that, I found Invenergy, which is a renewables energy company. Our portfolio has wind, solar, battery storage, and uh, natural gas power plants. So I started there back in 2013 um, as an EAM user, and then it, that evolved into being the owner of the EAM program for Invenergy. Awesome. Thank you for your service, by the way. Absolutely. Um, also, we have Rene Nazario. You may know him. He's the CEO of Visual K. And, you know, he's been here a while. So, Rene, thank you for joining us again. Thanks, Ernesto, and, and a pleasure to be here. Thanks for coordinating. And Frank, it's it's always awesome to to connect again. Uh, I know we we talk a little bit, but you know it's 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 great to see you. And again, thank you for your service. Really excited to be able to share a little bit about your experience and your insight. Right, I think it's it's very valuable uh, for our listeners. They want to you know, hey, here, how did it go? You know, what tips and and things that you can add value to. So so thank you, and and a pleasure to be here with you. Agreed. And we got to get you out to Chicago someday. Absolutely, man. Yeah. I, I lived there for four months. I was, uh, I work at uh, Argo National Lab. So oh, yeah. the nuclear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I got some stories for you about <laughs> uh, 20 some years ago. Uh, things were meant more. What the CPU, CP2, CP3, Chicago. That's what the, the first nuclear reactors were. As a matter of fact, uh, built and, and set there in Chicago. So, uh, fun stuff, really fun stuff. Yeah, so, interestingly, interestingly enough, uh, it's a small world. We had someone join from Argon uh, within the last couple of years. So, perhaps you two have crossed paths and <laughs> good time there. Awesome. Yeah, it's a it's a wonderful experience. I have very fun memories. And then the taste of Chicago during summer. It was it was it was fun. It was uh, it, it was amazing. So. I think one of the one of the interesting things, Frank, and, and, and you represent a very large company, and I know that you, you get your hands in, in a lot of stuff because we're also uh, exchanging other emails on, on, on other <laughs> topics, but I know it's been a journey, and I know it's not easy. I mean, you, you have a very large footprint, I believe, over, you know, 99 uh, parks and, 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 and different, you know, uh, situations, and, and you had, a, you know, small team, right? But can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how's been your journey in the, in the maintenance excellence, you know, and, and I know that, uh, you know, you, you've grown a lot, you, you move a lot. So, so if you can share a little bit about that journey and your experience, we highly appreciate it. Sure. So it, it's been a challenge. Um, I'd be lying if I said it was all smooth sailing. Uh, we've grown tremendously over the years, and luckily I was able to be a part of the process from a, a much simpler time back when we had about 16 wind projects to maintain. And as we've evolved in our capabilities and our ability to leverage EAM, uh, so have our, our, our groups within Invenergy, uh, like our growing data analytics team, we've got a department of engineers, they rely heavily on EAM to communicate um, you know, maintenance plans with the fleet. And then my own team has doubled in size uh, to accommodate the growth. Uh, and within that team, it's been pretty easy to keep everyone engaged and continually growing uh, in their own knowledge and skills, like learning SQL for uh, flex business rules, JavaScript for extensibility framework, 
and uh, Cognos reporting, uh, more and more intuitive reports that they've that they've um, built out. But oftentimes, these individuals they they've grown out of their their role in EAM, and I've seen some great talent from my group move on to other roles within Venergy. So I'm I'm happy for them, but. Um, but nevertheless, I remember seeing my first maintenance maturity chart at one of the, the conference I attended. You were likely at the same conference. Yep. Um, and every time I look at those, those charts, I, I look at it with an Invenergy perspective. And it seems like each time I see one of those charts, it, it um, shows the steps of maintenance excellence, maintenance maturity. And I say to myself, we've definitely been making progress, but uh, I won't say we're at the, the highest level yet, but, um, but we're getting there. Yeah, yeah, you, you guys are definitely doing a lot of interesting stuff. And I, and I think uh, just to put the perspective to, to the ones who, does, you know, the people that don't know a lot about Invergy, they've been living under a rock. Um, I mean, you guys are running everything on the cloud, right? Yes. Uh, so EAM has been on the cloud, I believe, since it was initially offered from uh, then owner Invor. Yeah, so, so I mean, I, I think... Uh, there was a major shift because before that, I believe you might be using other systems or, or some paper base or what everybody does, you know, the Excel world, right? And I know that was a, a major transformation going on your wind farms, right? And, and I know that not only you have wind farms in, in the US, but also other countries as well. So, so can you tell us a little bit about that mentality change, you know, going from, hey, this is my data, I got it here, you know, I can control it, this is something that I own. To, you know, now this is on the cloud, right? And by the way, you know, it's it's a whole different process, you know, as as you transform some of them, and then also you bring in, uh, you know, new people into this uh, new way of working. Um, so I can't really comment a whole lot on the shift to cloud because, uh, we, like I said, we we're early adopters of the cloud model. So as long as I can remember, we uh, we've had our uh, maintenance records in the cloud. Uh, we have shifted from the paper-based to digitizing, but um, by and large, that cloud environment already existed. You know, we we are used to hosting uh, data internally only when it um, hits certain regulations. So we're heavily regulated by NERC, for example. So a lot of things that touch NERC that we have slowly kind of relinquished control of that that self-hosted control and have started to trust the cloud. But um, by and large, our, our EAM platform and maintenance has been uh, cloud hosted, again, as, as far as I can remember. Yeah, re really interesting. And I think, uh, I mean, you, you guys have been uh, uh, really a role model on that. And tell me a little bit about, you know, the, the not so fun stories, right? Where you get resistance, where you, where you, you know, somebody says, you know what, that, that's good that you do it that way over there, but over here we do it a little <laughs> bit different. And, how, how have you been able to integrate? Because I know, again, you know, you guys have limited resources, right? It's not, you know, you right, can, right. you know, you get it, you get a new wind farm, it's a new wind farm. And everybody has to adapt to the way of doing business at, as, as you said, as, as a corporate standard. Uh, so when I introduced mobile and, and digitizing everything uh, at the initial rollout, I had to first convince leadership that this was the way to go. Um, I had to find out what we were missing out on, what we stood to gain, provide a list of benefits uh, in making that transition. So I started with taking the, the paper checklist that everybody was familiar with and um, recreating those in EAM so that uh, when the technicians were transitioning to uh, mo mobile checklists, they, they didn't feel like they're working with a completely new uh, way of, of doing their, their maintenance. Uh, then I, going back to the benefits that we, we stood to gain from it, um, I had to take some time and, and crunch some numbers and found out that we'd be saving, I think it was 750,000 sheets of paper in the first year by going digital. Wow. Um, yeah, and, and so the, the technicians no longer had to print out 30 pages per maintenance per turbine uh, and bring it with them. And then in addition to that, I asked, I just straight up asked the, the technicians, um, what do you envision this saving you every day? Um, you know, think about the time that you spend at the end of the day scanning these pages in, attaching them to work orders, and then the whole uh, work order closeout process. And it came out to 15 minutes a day. 
And it might not seem like a lot, but when you multiply that out by the number of technician right. work days in a year, and then you tie in some general assumptions on hourly pay, um, multiplying that all out came out to like a hundred, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's like 600,000, $600,000 of labor a year that they could wow. redirect towards other tasks. And so um, I gathered all this information, uh, put it in front of leadership and, and they gave the green light. And so I, I started with a pilot program, just two sites in 2015. One of them, I gave iPads, one I gave uh, Samsung tablets. Mm -hmm. And in the end, the iPads won out for a number of reasons. Um, right. And then after I addressed some of the early issues that they reported on, I would turn that into a rollout plan to get the remaining sites, um, a mix of in-person and remote training. I couldn't realistically visit every site. Uh, <laughs> so I, I did kind of a hybrid, uh, visited some and, and did some and shipped iPads and did some remote training for the others. Um, I mean, I was flying all over the country, some like a, a new state every two weeks. Uh, wow. I was loaded, loaded up a backpack full of iPads through airport security. Um, <laughs> no questions so asked. <laughs> yeah and and funny story every time every time i go through air, airport security with a backpack full of ipads they always question you like what are you doing with 10 ipads in a backpack and um you know the the nitrogen and glycerin swabs um just never ending <laughs> so by the end of 2016 I, I had i think a total of 20 20 wind sites using the eam disconnected app awesome that that's that's you know that's way forward thanks for sharing that so um, from, you know, from a perspective of you, you mentioned you did a pilot all the way to, you know, all the plants. Uh, how long of an effort was that? Um, so the, the initial two sites happened towards the end of 2015. And then I spent all of 2016 rolling it out to those 20 sites. And then um, after that, we kind of turned it into a uh, train the trainers type mm -hmm. of uh, approach. So every site that we rolled out after that, we didn't have to, to visit or do that remote training. We had uh, a mixture of documentation, how to's and refresher trainings. So every site that came online after that didn't need much help from my team. So I would say, uh, that initial year and a half was, was my real busy time rolling it out. And then after that, it kind of, uh, the program kind of ran itself. It sounds like the, the team actually accepted mobility after a while. Is that right? Um, there, yeah, there was some apprehension uh, going into this. There was a resistance of change from the folks who were used to doing maintenance the same way they always had. Uh, they had a sort of a, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind mm -hmm. of mentality. And then whenever I tried explaining the benefits we have to transitioning, um, some of those benefits admittedly were for the corporate side. So like all the new data that we could start reporting on. Um, but, I, but I found that the best tool to fight that apprehension was uh, just being available for them and taking their concerns seriously. Uh, but I would say today, in today's world, you've got a very different environment because most people use mobility in their everyday lives. They have iPhones or Android phones uh, they use daily for everything, texting, calendar reminders, and um, paying for your Starbucks order. And it's yep. just you know, part of everyday life. So I don't think the apprehension would be as big of an issue making the switch today. Awesome. Right. So would you say mobility or, you know, having digital items for your data gathering is something that you would be considering as an essential tool or, or more of an optional uh, resource? Uh, <clears throat> definitely essential. So just having the, um, having the benefit of, of that data availability alone makes it, makes it essential. And I would add to that that the safety component there means that everyone has relevant schematics at their fingertips uh, without having to lug around heavy binders or, or print out actual sheets of paper with the with schematics or or even um, more safety critical the lotto program. Once you print out a a lotto form, uh, lockout tagout for those of you who um, are not good with acronyms, but if you ever noticed on 
sheets of paper that say uncontrolled document when printed, they're talking about you having a piece of paper that is now stale and stagnant, uh, which is extremely important with a, with a lotto program because yeah. sometimes uh, OEMs, they come out with TILS, again, acronym heavy industry, mm -hmm. but uh, technical instruction letters that say you need to change up the uh, the way this this uh, circuit card is wired or some some fix to the turbine. But that lotto that was printed out, again, uncontrolled document when printed, it doesn't have that update to, to the wiring that was changed. So you go in with that old, stale, stagnant uh, lotto form, and you you have the risk of shock and, and worst case scenario, death from resulting from that. How about data quality? Did that get impacted? Like, you know, I don't know if papers got uh, lost or, you know, water damaged them or anything like that. Um, so I would say the data quality, we now had data that we could report on, whereas before the process was, you know, the, the pieces of paper that they take back to the shop and um, store it in a binder. And um, I wouldn't say that we would lose data, but it was inaccessible to us. It, it might as well have been, you know, just, just pictures in a, a document library. Um, you can't control F on a scanned piece of mm -hmm. paper um, because it's essentially a picture. Um, yeah, so essentially it it died there, right? You gathered exactly. the data for audit's sake and, you know, it didn't uh, work for you. Right, right. So before, if we had an audit or warranty claim, you'd dig through binders and find the maintenance records to prove that you did what you, what you had to for um, a valid warranty claim. But after uh, we switched to digital, we could just whip up a, a Cognos report and um, adding to not just the auditing and warranty claims process, but to your point about you know what added data we we now had, you could look at the checklist to see how long it took to complete the maintenance, if any steps took longer than others, even the order in which technicians were filling out the maintenance. Um, you know, we, we had all that at, a, at our fingertips and then going back to the auditing or uh, pulling all records, if we had to sell a site or um, we took on a new site and import data, it all kind of meshed together and, and we could, you know, deliver something that says here are all our maintenance records versus handing over binders full of paperwork. Yeah. How about your, you know, maintenance operations? Did that get uh, a positive impact? Um, I would say that we already had a, a pretty robust maintenance program. I mean, we had better availability and uptime than even the OEMs. So I would say that uh, it complements our maintenance program, but by and large, it's our culture that, that drove our, our operations. And if you don't already have a maintenance culture developed, mobile isn't going to fix that for you. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you have to have some sort of place for that to to get to to a point where you are reliable and you know you you get your maintenance in a good shape yeah sounds, sounds like uh like definitely uh, a story worth worth uh you know commenting and 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 ensuring um and and just starting to wrap it up a little bit of the conversation frank uh you know when when we talk to different maintenance managers and operations managers you know Sometimes, uh, you know, they see, they understand the gap, right? So, hey, I'm here. I want to be able to go to here, right? In that maturity model. And I want to be able to, you know, to, to get there. But, but basically, uh, there's a lot of challenges, right? And, and, and we see that on a daily basis. Obviously, you know, nobody has excess resources lying around and excess <laughs> there's not enough time in the day. And there's a lot of things going on and there's a lot of KPIs and, and new operations. So, I mean, when you think about the challenges and, and you know, that the maintenance professionals are, are facing, you know, uh, what would you say to them, you know, especially, you know, how do you see them from, from your perspective and, and, and what would you uh, tell the operations managers? I would say first and foremost, find the ROI in it and, um, it just accept the added cost. You know, you, you talked about not having the resources, but it, it really does um, 
you know, there's a, there's a saying it, it takes money to buy whiskey. Um, but I took a very budget friendly approach. Okay. And while I think that worked great for getting the leadership buy-in, it definitely made everything much more challenging than it, than it needed to be. Um, a, a mobile device management, for example, or um, EMM, I think is, is what it's called now, enterprise mobility management. That's something we kind of lacked from the get-go. And uh, we used what came with some uh, firewall software that we had. It was just kind of wrapped in as a bundle package. And mm -hmm. at, the, at the start, going into this, it seemed like that would, would do the trick. But that ended up with a, a whole slew of nightmares that uh, could have easily been avoided if we just, you know, ponied up and bought the proper software to uh, manage mobile devices. Um, another thing, another challenge would be for some industries, network coverage. So ideally, you'd have Wi-Fi coverage everywhere where a technician would bring a tablet. But right. but in reality, it's it's a pretty tall order. Um, we even found in our indoor environments, if you duck behind a large stainless steel tank, so thinking about our uh, natural gas facilities, right. you might lose Wi-Fi mid-maintenance for that. Um, and then a majority of our use case at the wind farms, sometimes we're out in the middle of nowhere, uh, you might not even have cellular service. Uh, so I'd say do some due diligence on, on any connection problems you might have and address them sooner rather than later. Super. Super. That's great. That's very helpful. Yeah. And, and as we, you know, as we wrap it up, I think one of the questions that, that we always try to ask is, you know, now that you've been through this process, right. And obviously you guys continue to improve and, and there are always going to be areas of opportunity, but as we look at this, right. And, and somebody that let's say, you know, wind it back to, to the beginning and, and somebody could have come to you and say, Hey, you know, let me let me give you a few a few pieces of advice on you know how we can make your life better in this digital transformation. And and everybody's journey is different, right? Depending on what they are. And like you said, right now there's more adoption. You know, there's more I think uh, cultural fit. But you know, what what would be your your most important pieces of advice? You know, if you can if you can advise any organization going through this, any maintenance professional, what would you tell them? Um, I would say to conduct thorough pilots. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, is don't underestimate any of the challenges, because if it's a, a minor nuisance for a few technicians at the first facility, it's, it's going to be amplified by a, a company wide rollout. So nip all those issues in the bud. Um, I talked about MDM uh, or EMM to manage the devices. If I can go back and do it over again, I would definitely um, mm -hmm. emphasize that more in my initial pitch. Um, support the program. So I think that my team and I supported the digital mm -hmm. transformation to the best of our ability. And um, that helped the technicians overcome that, that apprehension and um, getting them fully on board with the program. But if I, I think if I showed any signs of abandonment or, or not giving their concerns <laughs> or criticism proper attention, we might still be dealing with technicians refusing to adopt, adopt it to this day. Um, and then one thing that's helped tremendously is uh, since we are headquartered in Chicago and we've got all these facilities sprinkled throughout the, the US and we've expanded into Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, Brazil, uh, El Salvador, a um, little bit of presence in Canada and, and a little bit in Europe, we designated a, a local resource at each of these sites that we uh, regularly um, kind of touch base with okay. on a recurring basis. And, you know, since we can't realistically be out there where all the technicians are, this person on site mm -hmm. has been our, our biggest advocate and our ally out there. And uh, they've done a great job of filtering all the issues and concerns and feedback, uh, both negative and positive. And they've worked great with our with our Chicago staff. So definitely have your local resources out there if you are not in a uh, position where you can be where your technicians are. Super, that's great. Well, appreciate that advice. I, I'm sure it's gonna be very useful for the folks starting their journey. Absolutely, happy to share. All right, Frank, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, hopefully we didn't bombard you with too many questions. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, as this and every other episode, you can see it in 
our platforms. We have LinkedIn, we have Twitter, we have our visualk.com blog. Um, we also have platforms where you can see this episode and others. So that would be YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Anchor FM. Um, and as always, thank you for joining. Uh, feel free to uh, revisit this and other episodes. Um, Frank, thank you very much for being here. Renee, thank you as well. Um, so Frank, uh, hopefully we can meet again and perhaps in person next time. Absolutely. I'll, I'll come out your way. Yeah, absolutely. So, so thanks for everything you do, Frank. I know you, you are basically an ambassador for, for EAM and I know that you've been around. So we appreciate that very much. And thanks for your time. I think this is very valuable. Ernesto, Ernesto thanks for coordinating. And uh, another episode is in the can. Thank you. Thanks, guys. See you later.